to call upon uh, Michael Hartford. Uh, I'd just like to say a few words. Uh, he's a director of West End Neighbours, and our community is very fortunate to have Michael. Uh, he's a professional. To Michael. Randy carefully formatted all his menus in Japanese so that no one can fool around with his computer. <laughs> Thank you, Randy, for the introduction, and uh, I'd like to thank each of you for coming out. It's uh, The worst thing is planning a party and not having people show up, so uh, this was short notice and uh, kind of seat of the pants planning, but we're happy to see people have come out. Um, as Randy said, I am a municipal planner. I wasn't going to admit who I work for, but I do work for the District of North Vancouver. Um, I've certainly learned a lot about the city of Vancouver in the last couple of years. Um, I hadn't necessarily planned to learn as much as I have, but uh, to some extent it's uh, been a pleasure to learn a bit more about my neighborhood and about how the city of Vancouver works. So the purpose of my presentation tonight is to talk a little bit about 150 years of development in the West End and to conclude with an update on the major projects that are going on in the West End. And I'll ask if you can bear with me a little bit on my voice. Uh, it may give out at some point during the presentation. Um, I am pleased to include uh, Tico Kerr's painting of the Darling House at the start of the presentation, and, and that's also on display at the side of the room. Um, so the history of development in the West End starts in the 1860s, and um, the entire chunk of West End, the area in red on the map, was purchased by three men called the Three Greenhorns, and there used to be a restaurant in this building called the Three Greenhorns. Uh, these were three Englishmen who were criticized because um, everyone assumed the West End was worthless. And as a bit of context, everything in BC was focused on, uh, or politics and business was focused on New Westminster, and the rail line had yet arrived in Vancouver, so uh, Vancouver and the West End were a very different place. So not much happened until 1886. The land was cleared and uh, lots were sold off. Um, I'm sure the realtors in the group would be interested to know the selling price of the lots at three, $350 to $1,000. But by 1888, the area was uh, becoming quite a respectable area and wealthy folks in Vancouver were interested in building homes here. So we had some uh, rather extravagant homes built, like Gabriola, um, built in 1900 on Davy Street. Um, there was no zoning in place at the time. Between the 1880s and 1920s, basically people could build what they wanted on their lot. And um, we're fortunate that some of them built lovely structures that we still have in the West End. Other people built more modest homes. Um, these are on Barclay Street and um, various single-family homes still exist in the West End in different states of preservation. Um, as I said, there was no zoning in place, and basically the heights of buildings were limited by the construction techniques of the time. Uh, there were some six- to seven-story uh, block-style apartment buildings that were built. This one's on Butte Street, and another example is on Thurlow Street. This is called Hampton Court. So, Following the Depression, zoning was enacted in the West End, and from the 1930s to the early 50s, the zoning allowed um, many of the three-story walk-up buildings that uh, we see throughout the West End. There used to be many more. Many were uh, demolished for redevelopment. Um, some of these, uh, most of us would think, have quite a lot of character. This one was built in the 1930s on Nelson Street. It's called the Queen Anne Apartments, and lots of them look like this. And um, they're not necessarily the most interesting buildings, but they do provide affordable accommodation in the West End, and many of them are quite well maintained. Um, the zoning allowed for three-story buildings with a penthouse, and you can see in the right-hand photo, the developer was obviously being quite cagey about how they used their penthouse space by making it look like a four-story building. Um, the drawback to these buildings was that they basically built to the side and rear property lines. So, when you got many of these buildings built down the street, you really impaired uh, privacy and sunlight access and livability for the residents of those units. So in the mid-1950s, a new planning director had arrived at City Hall. His name was Gerald Sutton Brown. And he was intent on converting the West End to a different type of neighborhood. He saw the West End as a place where 
workers who worked downtown could live, but he wanted them to live in a different type of housing than either a rooming house or a three-story walk-up. So new zoning bylaws were enacted and they basically eliminated the height limit in the West End and they introduced um, a new measure of development potential called floor space ratio. And given that floor space ratio or FSR will come up many times this evening and in the next years as we move through the community planning process, I thought I'd give a little um, two minute brief on what floor space ratio is. So it's a measure of density, and it's uh, the number that is produced when dividing the total floor area of a building by the size of the lot on which the building sits. So basically it's a way to measure um, how much floor space is on a particular lot. If you had a 10,000 square foot lot, and you put 10,000 square feet of floor area on the lot, you would have an FSR of 1.0. You could also pile that floor space differently on the lot into a four-story building, but as long as it was still 10,000 square feet of space, it would still be an FSR of 1.0. So the West End at the time was permitted a blanket FSR of 3.0. And it's interesting to realize that all of those high rises that were built in the 50s, 60s, and 70s were built at 3.0 FSR. Um, many of them are very large buildings, but they're on very large lots. The purpose of the zoning was to try to avoid the box style of three-story walk-up that had been produced. And um, Sutton Brown was very interested in the idea of tall, slim apartment buildings. So by the early 1960s, developers had taken up this new zoning, and um, there were lots of high-rises under construction in the West End. Between 62 and 75, there were more than 220 high-rises built, which is a lot of development in a 15-year period. This photograph is um, west of Denman in, uh, I think, 1966, and that's um, Emerald Terrace in the middle of the uh, picture just under construction at that time. So it's also interesting to look at the progression that took place over this 15-year period in terms of um, how developers were building these buildings. Um, many of the earlier buildings were quite small. Um, 10 to 12 stories was not unusual for these earlier high-rise buildings. Four suites per floor was not uncommon, and my first apartment in the West End was in one of those small um, four suite per floor buildings, which is quite lovely because everyone's on a corner. Um, the later buildings built into the 1970s became quite a bit bulkier. So this is an example of a, a smaller floor plate West End high-rise on uh, Burnaby Street. And then these are the types of buildings we were starting to get by the early 1970s. These are still an FSR of 3.0. So this is 3.0, and so is this. It's just that they're on bigger lots. Um, something that's consistent about most of the buildings built in the West End is that even when the buildings look like this, they have quite a lot of green space around them. So because they're on larger lots, there was land available for significant landscaping, and that's something that I think creates the character of the West End. By the mid-1970s, there were some public concerns expressed about lots of development taking place in the West End. There were concerns that too many people were being jammed into the West End. There were not community facilities available. Um, a new government came in at City Hall, and um, I think we have someone at the back of the room who was a member of that new government, and uh, may be uh, willing to share some of his observations during the uh, question and answer period of the, the evening tonight. But um, the zoning was changed in the mid-1970s. Uh, the floor space ratio was reduced and uh, a height limit was placed on buildings in the West End. There were also some um, social changes that were made in the West End. A community centre was built. That's when the West End Community Centre was constructed on Diamond Street. And because of the huge amount of traffic that was cutting through the West End to get to the Lionsgate Bridge, some traffic diversion techniques were undertaken, including some of the first mini parks that were built west of Denman. Um, so then we have 10 years of somewhat relative calm. There were some buildings built during that period, but they tended to be lower rise, somewhat bulkier buildings. And in the mid-1980s, there was a recognition that it was important not just to regulate the FSR and the height of the building, but also the character of the buildings that were being built. 
there was a concern that livability needed to be protect protected and that you could influence the um, character of the neighborhood by the type of architecture that was being built. So in 1987, the council adopted what was called the West End Residential Areas Policy Plan. And um, this was the last comprehensive planning process that the West End had had until the current process. And it really allowed the community to examine what was special about the West End and to incorporate some policies in the plan that would preserve what was special and still allow the community to move forward. Um, what's kind of interesting is that the plan was never adopted as an official development plan for the West End. It was adopted as council policy and then zoning changes were brought in um, to implement that plan. But for many other neighborhoods in Vancouver, and I believe for our current West End planning process, the plan will eventually be adopted by bylaw. And that gives the plan more legal clout than the current policy plan has for the West End. So the zoning changes that were adopted in 1989, uh, Randy alluded to these, and basically they uh, provided a new set of residential zones, uh, which are the yellow in the map. Uh, there were three types of RM5 zones. So the, um, the yellow on the map are the three RM5 zones, and basically these have three different um, densities or FSRs associated with them. Essentially the middle of the West End was the lowest density, and then as you went west of Denman or closer to English Bay, the densities got higher. And the intention of this was to try to um, recognize the character of each of those distinctive areas of the West End. You can see on this map from the policy plan, the RM5 area in the middle of the neighborhood was intended to be preserved as a low density area. And I, or low relative to West End standards, not low relative to the west of Vancouver. But um, the success of the implementation of that plan is evident in the West End now. When you're west of Denman or you're on the slopes south of Davie Street, you're in a higher density area. Whereas the um, area north of Davie and um, east of Denman is generally lower density because developments that have taken place since 1989 have been reflective of that lower density in the zoning. So some people have suggested that there hasn't been any development in the West End since 1989 and uh, there have actually been over 5,000 dwelling units added to the West End. But with 26,000 dwelling units in the West End now, 5,000 is a significant um, component of that. Most of those developments have been um, mid to low rise developments like the one on the left in the screen. Some of them have been rather towering examples like the one on the right. But it's interesting to note that the one on the right is still only an FSR of 4.0, slightly over the traditional 3.0 FSR for the West End. So fast forward to 2008. Um, residents in the West End were starting to get concerned about development pressures in the neighborhood. A town hall meeting was held because apparently that's always a good way to get people talking about things and sharing their ideas. STIR was adopted in 2009. This was the short term incentives for rentals program, and additional applications were made under that program. West End Neighbors was born, mainly as a result of STIR and some of the rezoning applications associated with that. So following that, City Council approved a planning process for the West End. And that was something that the petition that Randy mentioned had asked for, so we're, we're all hopeful that that will result in a positive outcome. But the consideration of the rezoning applications in the West End continues. So uh, Randy had asked if I could do a little bit of a rundown on the applications that are either approved or ongoing in the West End. So I, I picked, I think there's five of them here, and I'll do a quick rundown of those. Uh, 1215 Bidwell Street is the Maxine's development project. This was the old Balthazar um, restaurant. Um, the project is 85 condominiums and 49 rentals. There was preservation of the heritage facade of the Maxine's building, uh, which was a heritage C-listed building. Uh, the STIR component of the project included a 195% density bonus from the existing 2.2 FSR. 
and the developer was eligible for a waiver of the developed cost levy on the rental units. It's interesting for this project that the initial rezoning application came in in 2008 prior to the existence of STIR and it included a rental component. So the developer timed the proposal quite well because they were able to take advantage of STIR after STIR was adopted when they would not have been able to um, have the development gone to completion in 2008. So the um, heritage component of the project is highlighted in the red circle in the drawing. Um, I think for anyone that's walked by the site, when you recognize that there was an increase in density on this site from 2.2 to 6.27, uh, you may have some difficulty identifying the heritage component that's left. Yeah. And I've, I've highlighted it in red, um, just in case you've had some trouble finding it. So I think this is a challenging project for residents in the West End, that there were 49 rental units created. Those are at the base of the building, surrounded in red. And the rezoning was approved in 2009, development permit issued in 2010, and currently under construction. So Beach Towers is another rezoning application in the West End. Um, I think everyone who's lived in the West End for more than a week knows where Beach Towers is. Um, it's a 607-unit rental project that was built between 1965 and 1968. It won uh, some design awards at the time, and it's currently listed as a Heritage A um, heritage resource on the city's heritage inventory. It's also the second most dense block in the West End. Um, the proposal under the rezoning is to add 136 market rental units, some of them townhouses facing the water that I don't think will be renting for $1,100 a month. Um, there's 107,000 square feet of floor area and the density is proposed to increase from the existing 3.42 to 4.35. 2.2 FSR is the zoned density on that site. There's three buildings or three sets of buildings proposed. A uh, four-story building on Beach Avenue, um, two-story two buildings with 11 units um, along Harwood Street, and the largest is a nine-story building at the corner of Harwood and Cardero. Um, this is a current view through the site to the water. This is the building that would be located on that corner. Um, so this is two different views of that same building. The project is still active as a rezoning. Um, there hasn't been a lot of information on it lately, but it did receive endorsement um, by the Urban Design Panel and the Heritage Commission, and uh, it could come to council at any point as far as the community is concerned. Uh, 1245 Harwood Street is the site of the Lighthouse, and that was a, a Category A heritage building built in 1899. Um, many people aren't very familiar with it because you can't see it very well from Harwood Street. Part of the reason you can't see it very well is because it's also the site of a very large tulip tree. And this tree is considered to be the largest um, of its kind in Western Canada, and it may be the oldest non-native tree in Vancouver. It was probably planted at the time the house was built. So there was an option one on this. It was an 18-story tower with 46 condos and eight rental units. It included restoration of the house, but removal of the tree. It had an increase in density to 3.7 from the existing 2.2, and that required what was called a heritage revitalization agreement. Council denied that heritage revitalization agreement, and they asked planning staff to go back and have some more discussions with the developer for a, a more workable solution. Instead, the developer came back with option two, which is a 17-story tower that looks an awful lot like the 18-story tower. Um, it's now 36 condo units, eight rental units. It retains the tulip tree, but demolishes the heritage house. So that project complies with the 2.2 FSR. The development permit has been approved, and um, I think imminently a building permit and demolition permit will be applied for on that site. Um, a more positive story for the West End is 1090 Nicholas Street, which is the Darling House. It was built in 1905. It was occupied by the same family until about 10 years ago. 
there was a proposal made to move the house to the corner of the property and add eight townhomes to the site, also to renovate and restore the heritage house and convert that to condos. So I don't have great graphics on this, but this is the view from the lane to the south of the property. Um, this is the view on Nicholas Street with the heritage house and a tall townhouse next to it. Construction has started on this project. The development permit was approved and the building permit was issued. There's been no density increase on this site. Um, it's 1.5 FSR under the zoning and that's consistent with the project. There were some slight variances to um, yards and building envelope. But at the end of the day, the house will be restored and designated as a heritage resource, which I think is very positive for the West End. So now the biggie, uh, 1401 Comox Street is a stir rezoning proposal. This is an image of uh, St. John's Church that used to, be, used to be on the property, and I'm trying not to think of this as a progression from uh, the church sitting on its own site at 1.5 FSR to an empty lot after the developer demolished a 30-year-old institutional building to the proposed building at 7.19 FSR. Um, the current project includes removal of the 3,500 square foot community space that was offered in the previous version of the project. It has 186 market rental suites. There will be no control on the rents. These will rent for what the market will bear. It's 22 stories high with a total building height of 200 feet. As I mentioned, density increases from 1.5 to 7.19. And there have been some changes made to the top 15 floors of the building to try to reduce the amount of shadow on the Route Street Mini Park. It doesn't eliminate shadowing. Um, this is the existing development rights on the site at 1.5 FSR. It's about 26,000 square feet of floor area. Um, this is an indication of the, the box that's proposed, and it's 124,000 square feet of floor area. So 26,000 to 124,000. Um, this is the view north on Broughton Street. The building on the left is the Gainsborough, one of those six-story box buildings built in the 1920s. And this is an indication of what the new building would look like in that area. Um, this is a view of the building south, uh, beyond the Broughton Street Mini Park, and most of the renderings that have been shown by the developer on this project have been from a helicopter, and I find that I relate much better to views from the street, so it, I think it's something that people should ask for as part of development review, is how am I going to perceive this building from the street. So, many people have expressed concerns with the development, um, ranging from density bonus to shadowing to impacts on livability, um, the fact that rental rates will be market rentals, the fact that the proposed seniors units, um, the six units reserved for seniors will only be protected for five years. Oh. Um, my major bone of contention with this project is that there's been no compelling argument provided for the increase in density. There's been no discussion about a density at four, five, or six. Every proposal on this site has been for a density in excess of seven FSR. The existing zoning allows a floor plate of about 1,500 square feet, which is what's shown in gray on this diagram. The developer is proposing a floor plate of 6,000 square feet. So, Someone needs to provide me a better argument for why they go from this to this on this site, and I have not seen that argument. Um, so what's the alternative? I think we could look at something like the Columbus Tower that was built at Broughton and Davie Street. It's a 2.75 FSR. Um, that would be consistent with the highest FSR in the original 1989 zoning. This is a nine-story building. It provides subsidized rental accommodation, and I don't think anyone remembers the public hearing for it in 2004 because it wasn't contentious. And I think providing development that can be embraced by the community is a large part of allowing the community to move forward. So what can we do? Uh, we can go to the public hearing on Monday, June 11th, and whether we support the project, we oppose it, or we're indifferent, I think we should share our opinions with City Council. So as Randy mentioned, there's opportunities to sign up either 
through the WENT website or um, at the back of the room for information on the public hearing. So I'll leave it at that on a positive note, and I will turn it back to Randy. <laughs>